for this whenever I would attempt to speak in front of a group. I want you to go like this, and that means cut it off, you've blown it, we're done. <laughs> But, uh, when he started off, he made a statement that there was a large volume of scripture that deals in one form or another with money. And we're going to cover every one of them. So get comfortable, get ready. And, no, we're actually going to just cover. Uh, yeah, all right. <laughs> uh, appreciate it. Uh, cover a few scriptural things. There's always a tendency, anytime you talk about money, to wing it. And that is always a mistake. And I'm going to try not to wing anything. We'll talk about what the Bible says. Not to give you anything particularly different. In fact, uh, everything we'll talk about but one is exactly what he said. It'll just be to emphasize it a little bit. And... But let me ask you one question. Oh, yeah, by the way, there is a test at the end. I'm not going to say any more until we get to the test. So, I learned a long time ago that one of the things that an ill-prepared teacher does, just get a test. You know? so, I'll fall back on that if I see it going south. Anyway, um, one of the things that, that's a little bit difficult, uh, and I don't know why it is so, for believers. This lesson is for believers. And some of the scriptures I want to talk about are Old Testament. In fact, a lot of them are. And, but also the New Testament. It is for believers. Keep that in mind. And it's a whole other lesson as to whether this works for the non-believer or not. I'm not going there today at all. Uh, but one of the problems that believers have when they hear a teaching like what Rick Warren very effectively gave us is when you walk out the door and you get back home and you go to your little desk where you have your checkbook and your records and all that to buy into this. And I've asked myself for a long time, why do Christians have so much trouble buying into money and the biblical principles that are chucked through the Bible all the way through? And I've come up with only one answer, and it's not unique to me. And that's the fact we've got to understand that everything we say and do with regard to money should be viewed as worship. It is an act of worship. It is integral to worship. And I hope I can kind of give you some scriptures to support that. Um, when you buy into what scripture has to say, it's usually a little bit helpful to one, believe in it, but know what it says. So oftentimes, you know, we, we've had a barrage of scripture through a lot of excellent preaching, excellent teaching over the years, so much that we can't remember a specific thing sometimes. But there is a principle that starts off, and I'm, I know I'm going to have to move a little fast. If you want any of these references and I've moved too fast, I'll give them to you after, after we're done. But if you want to try to keep up, uh, turn to Psalm 19. In a way, it has nothing to do with money, but in another way, it's got everything to do with money. And I'm going to begin uh, with verse 7. And this has to do with, again, believers buying in to what Rick Warren just said and a few of the things that we're going to look at here. In, in Psalms 19.7, it says, and I, I'm using the Holman version, and there, there's little differences, but it says the same thing. The instruction of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy, making the inexperienced wise. The precepts of the Lord are right, making the heart glad, and the commandment of the Lord radiant, making the eyes light up. Man, you say, what in the world does that have to do with it? It means this is for real folks. God didn't give us a bunch of financial platitudes just to talk about in Sunday school. This is what works in the real world. You know, when you're back at that desk trying to make a budget go or wondering why there's problems. You know, and to a degree I may be preaching to the choir in this particular department, but I, I, I just flat be willing to, to bet money that you know somebody you can share these things with, particularly younger people. Um, you know, financial problems are not unique to only young, but they have their share. And sometimes it's because of just not being involved in this. 
Believers' financial health really is founded on three <coughs> biblical principles. He used seven, and these are included. They're, they're, they're not exclusive, but they come together. Number one, it has always, finan biblical financial health, far back as the Old Testament, has always been founded on worship. If you try to pull it out and set it on a shelf and say this is just the financial side that I have to deal with, it doesn't really apply. Wrong. It is part of worship. I always remember that. Number two, it involves spiritual obedience. And I think we all have our troubles with being obedient you know, from time to time. And last, and, and I, I'm not going to say it's the most important of these three, but it's certainly super important. Believers are stewards of God's provision. You don't own it. I don't own it. None of us own it. It belongs to God. We just have the steward's responsibility of honoring it, using it appropriately, and receive the Lord's promised blessings because of it. Now, what are the obstacles to financial health to believers? I believe it comes down to two big general things. Number one would be ignorance of sound biblical teaching. By ignorance, I don't mean anything tacky. I mean just not really being aware and thinking about uh, what the Bible has said from the very beginning. Secondly, is believers' disobedience. <clears throat> you know, you may have experienced some disobedience. You may, you know, rebel a little bit from various things <laughs> in, in, uh, in God's Word. And money is one that believers really rebel in. Uh, I don't know, I suspect this might be a little bit wrong for our church, but the average Southern Baptist church has less than 15% of their membership that tithe. I'm talking about adult membership, not kids. And you think about it, hmm. and you know, I, I don't know and don't need to know the finances of this church, but when I see the fact that we met the size of a budget that we have. And I look at that average attendance, it tells me this church is way ahead of the curve. Um, I don't know what that would be. There's another thing that we don't want to admit sometimes as believers in the United States. I'm going to pull this one in, and that's the American lifestyle. I think our American <clears throat> lifestyle does more to confuse a Christian who is trying to do things right, then you can shake a stick at you. Now, he talked about the sale. There is no such thing as a sale. There is only things that are for sale. And you may pay a little less this uh, to be the uh, sale that's going on this week, but you still pay for it, to be honest. But the thing is really not so much the fact that you went and bought it. I'm not even, uh, you know, I, I would get in a lot of trouble if I started trying to go uh, that direction. But the real uh, issue is, what's the motive behind it? And he talked about it. Do you really need it? Does it glorify God? Is it a part of a believer's life that ministers, says, thank you, Lord, and is a good outward uh, example and testimony to others? Um, he talked about good records. I'm going to do this real quick. One of our closest friends in the whole world is a rancher. Uh, back in uh, outside of Carlsbad. He's got one of the biggest black Angus bull operations uh, really in this end of the country. You wouldn't believe the records that man has. That's what she does for him, keep up with his records. And, and does it over the internet. And he has been blessed unbelievably. And I have dealt with a lot of ranchers before in my money career. And there, one of them comes close to him when it comes to maintaining records. And he tithes. And he gives offerings. And the Lord has blessed unbelievably. In a difficult, difficult business. Okay, let's move on a little bit. Um, Psalm 19 tells us we believe what the Bible says. In a mature believer's life, you already know that. But it's neat that the, the scripture said it. Well, let's look a little bit further. One of the big claims... I, that people have why they don't give anything remotely like a tithe is I can't afford to. I can't give it up. Why should I give that away? I need it to buy groceries. I need it for the jet ski. 
I need it for the trip. I need it, you know, I need it, I need it, I need it. Well, let's take a look and see what Psalm 37, starting with verse 23, says. It says, A man's steps are established uh, by the Lord. He takes pleasure in his way. Though he fails, he will not be overwhelmed because the Lord holds his hand. And I have, now here's where it gets good. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous abandoned or his children begging bread. I, one, one principle, you are not going to sacrifice anything that matters by being faithful. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's the sure way to have your needs met, being faithful. Let's move on just a little bit, and I'll explain this right here. I like this part of any time I talk about money, and it, I'm running my old little test to see who's going to jump on me. Hear me out before you do. The scissors ready. Yeah, get the scissors ready back there. <laughs> Is a 10% tithe all that was asked of the children of Israel? No. So, being a little tacky, let me just say, when somebody says, I can't afford 10%, I almost have to laugh. Because when the children of Israel were faithful, Filled and obedient, they were blessed and unbelievable. Can you imagine wandering around a desert where there is no particular food or water, and yet you didn't go hungry for 40 years? Yeah, that's quite a quite a quite a lesson to that. The Old Testament tithe for the Hebrews, I won't give you all, I don't have time to go into the whole background of it. It's 23 and a third percent if you annualize it. You say, how could that possibly be? Well, I'm gonna hustle and try to show you. Look in uh, Numbers uh, eight, uh, chapter 18. And this is the, uh, we'll look at verses 21 and, and 23 real quickly. It says, look, I have given the Levites every tenth, Levites every tenth in Israel as an inheritance uh, in return for the work they do and the work of the tenth of the meeting. Why did I say worship? Here, this far back, we talk about what? The tent, the tent of meeting. That was the central place of their worship out there, let's say in the desert, if you will, and, and then off. So this is the tent that they came, you know, for the paid professional clergy. Well, let, let's use that kind of language just for, <coughs> this is where they came from. This is where it came from. This is the 10% that you commonly, commonly think about. That, you know, like the, some of the, infom uh, what, the infomercials, infomercials, but wait, there's more. <laughs> uh, let's take a look over Deuteronomy chapter 12. And I'll start with verse 5. It says, and this has to do uh, with the chosen place of worship. That's a little heading in this whole chapter. And I know I'm jumping in without all the background to it, but it says, Instead, you must go into the place your God chooses from all your tribes to put his name for his dwelling. What's, what, what does that boil down to? Where you worship. Okay? You are uh, to bring there your burnt offerings and sacrifices, your tenths and personal contributions, your vow offerings, free will offerings, and the firstborn of your herds and flocks. You will eat there in the presence of the Lord your God and rejoice with your household in everything you do because the Lord has blessed you. What are they talking about? The Jewish festivals. They came together at certain times of year for the Jewish festivals. You know, there's a kind of a tasteless joke, but in a way it makes a point. It's a big, big, big uh, television uh, preacher one time was talking about. It says, you know, salvation is free. These cameras cost a lot. Well, the Lord relationship was free. God provided even the Old Testament. But there's a reality there in the worship. And those festivals, that is a rich, rich study. And probably have done that before. When you look at it, that is some of the highest form of worship that the Hebrews were involved in. Was, there, was all that. But wait, there's more. Look at Deuteronomy 14. And 
look, uh, this has to do with the tenth for the Lord. Um, uh, and verse 27 says, do not forget the Levite within your gates. This is a little different application. And in verse 28, it says, at the end of every three years, bring a tenth of your produce for that year and store it within your gates. Then the Levite, who has no portion or inheritance among you, now get this, the foreign resident, the fatherless, the widow within your gates may come, eat, and be satisfied, and the Lord your God will bless you. And notice that was at the end of every three years that this was done. Okay, so that's where the third, if you annualize it, you know, you got two, like this year you've got really 20% this year, and then you have on the third year an additional 10. So it comes out, if you want to play with numbers, to that. But what really matters is the fact that it comes out to meet the needs of the needy. And isn't that part of worship over at the church? Isn't there a talk there about what is undefiled religion? It's one of the good places the word religion is used, taking care of those who need it, what it really kind of boils down to. The, uh, in the New Testament, it's going to shift gears a little bit now. One guy that I really enjoy uh, his writings uh, the best way to explain uh, New Testament uh, stewardship and, and biblical principles of economics, if you will, is that it is spirit-controlled grace giving. And if you're going to be involved in spirit-controlled grace giving, we can still find all kinds of examples through the New Testament that it involves worship. We can't get away from worship in this, and it is an act of worship when you're being faithful. Take a look in, uh, uh, let me get lost here if I'm not careful, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This is the chapter where Paul was making an appeal to complete a collection that was being offered, but there's a really interesting little principle that you can kind of go right over if you're not careful. Uh, Take a look down there and start in verse 12. It says, For the eagerness is there, and this is their eagerness to participate and give into this collection, it is acceptable according to what one has, not what uh, he does not have. It is not that there may be relief for others and hardship for you, but it's a question of equality. In the interest of time, I'm not going to read the rest of it, but one of the reasons that one church, a New Testament church, is to things such as the cooperative program, to various missions, uh, to go and, and help out with churches at different places, is it so that basic needs are met, so there can be equality in their worship. In other words, you know, the preacher's not up there with a nagging uh, stomach, hungry, and people are not there because they're too, uh, you know, they're without homes. In other words, there was a real economy. Let's take care of Believers taking care of believers in other congregations uh, according to God's provision and what he provided and being faithful stewards of it so there can be equality in worship. Another uh, good, I can really just uh, over in, in one more page, you might say over in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 6, it says, remember this. And this is an answer to those who, who might be worried, say, I flat can't give it, I need the money. You know, I cannot be faithful because I need it, okay? Remember this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Now, you've heard that before a lot. You've probably heard the next, but, but I what I've just read to this. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not out of regret or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver, and God is able to, to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. So, you know, this is not a hard pill for any believer to swallow. What it is is an act of worship. That, remember we had scripture about a radiant face? It actually can put a radiant face on you as you give thanks to the Lord for the ability to do these sorts of things that he provided to start with. <clears throat> Quickly, 
we're about to run out of time. I'm just going to talk about it rather than read it to you. In Luke uh, chapter 6 and in 1 Timothy uh, chapter uh, 6, you'll find principles that have to do with God's law of reciprocity. In other words, you can't outgive God. If you're faithful with a spirit-controlled, spirit-filled heart in your finances too, uh, to do what you should, you can't outgive him. You don't have to worry about running short. Your needs will be met. Um, <laughs> This has been talked about, I know in, uh, oh, uh, who, I'm trying to remember the guy's name is Crown Financial, Larry Burkett, he talks about this a great deal in some of the things I've heard him talk about, God's law of reciprocity. Uh, we're even told that we can test God in Malachi. It's the only place in the Bible that we're told we can test God. And it's interesting and it's in financial faithfulness. One of the things I'd be really remiss and it'll, it'll help us get to our test question here. If way in the very back of the Bible, you'll find uh, three uh, very short letters written by John. Go to 3 John, if you will. You might say, I don't think the early church cared as much about money and prosperity. I don't know whether they did or not, but I know that John, who was inspired by the Holy Spirit, wrote this in 3 John chapter 2. It says, Dear friend, I pray that you may prosper in every way and be in good health just as your soul prospers. He addresses three areas there. Financial well-being, physical well-being, and spiritual well-being. And he called it prosperity. And he's talking about it in the sense of worship and obedience. Um, our financial health should always be bathed in prayer. And that's what we said that in the New Testament it is a spirit-controlled, uh, spirit-filled uh, issue and an act of a worship. Don't we always, particularly for wise, bathe that in prayer? I'm of the opinion, back when I used to fight and argue with myself about whether a person should give 10% or not, I just started praying to the Lord, Lord, you give me the number I'm supposed to give. Let's quit arguing about this, and I know I'm the arguer, but I'm tired of hearing the preacher tell me I ought to do that. What number should I have? You know what I found out? It wound up 10% in very short order. And I have heard other people say exactly the same thing. You know, spiritual health and financial health absolutely go hand in hand. Why? Because it's all part of worship. Let's go to our test question, and uh, this will be good with me to run out the door on to somebody you not like. It. I don't know if any of you saw, you probably did, uh, on the internet news, uh, where I got, got this, this question, where it came from. What does a $60,000 jet, 60 million, I'm sorry, 60 million, thank you. What does a $60 million jet have to do with our lesson? Okay, now here's the test. We got, we got three possibilities that we can check. Absolutely nothing. What are you thinking when you put something like that in a Sunday school class? You know, is it time to start doing this? Uh-oh, maybe something after all or unfortunately, lots. Let me give you the background real quick, and I apologize if anybody thinks <coughs> of this, but I think it is very symptomatic of misguided uh, believers' spiritual principles, let's put it that way. There is a mega church in the Atlanta area, supposedly has 200,000 members. The pastor of that church asked those 200, thousand members. I don't know if they included babies and uh, <laughs> ten-year-olds or not. And it, I, that wasn't real clear. But they would all contribute, I believe it was, what, $300? I don't know if you were going, maybe you saw the article. I think they all they would contribute $300 each. Now, this was about their normal offerings, I assume. He could buy, this is a replacement. Keep that in mind. This is to replace a $60 million jet. And because the other jet had been run off the runway somewhere in France where you know, he had been ministering. Um, 
I'm not going to give you the name. I, would, I don't know the name of the church, and I don't care, and I'm not going to give you the name of the preacher. But I think this actually has a lot to do because I personally would have to question the spirit-controlled, spirit-filled heart that motivated this. And if we examine our own hearts, and we may not be out buying a $60 million jet, but we may be doing something you know, a little more uh, down, down, down home, down to earth, if you will. Like that. If we just look at our hearts and say, Lord, show me what I need to do. Let me be faithful. And then whatever is above that, do I save it? Do I give it to a legitimate ministry that flows through the local church? You know, that kind of thing. Control my motives, control my heart, and let me let the way I handle my finances be a testimony to you and an act of worship and things. I think we've kind of taken some of these things together with what Rick Warren said. We can certainly help ourselves and we can certainly help uh, young people that uh, seem to really have a struggle. You know, with